my head again Making my way through crowded thoughts Sometimes it's hard to get out of it Broke my heart in the dark I was just trying to feel something Falling asleep to the sound of it Always used to let you clean up the mess Just down on my knees Thought I couldn't stand up on my own Turns out sometimes you're stronger alone My name is Kalani. I'm 19 years old. I'm currently one of Jehovah's Witnesses and I will be shunned. All right, Kalani, that's uh, pretty ominous there at the end. Um, so I guess maybe we'll establish up front that you are Pimo, right? Yes, I am. <laughs> All right. And for those, I guess, who are uninitiated or, uh, you know, maybe are listening who were never Jehovah's Witnesses, Pimo, P-I-M-O stands for physically in, mentally out. So that's a person who is in the congregation or doing the things they need to do as one of Jehovah's Witnesses at times to uh, keep up appearances or whatever the case may be, keep family uh, and not be shunned. But um, mentally does not really believe this anymore. And um, it's sad that a lot of people, there's a lot of people in that have to do this. Uh, congratulations. I know it takes courage to speak out as someone in that position. You, yep. uh, you're, you're a strong, strong kid. Uh, please don't take offense at me calling you a kid. No, I, I, am, one. Old. I am one. I wear it proudly. <laughs> um, but no, man, like, you know, good for you for, for taking this step and, and, and speaking your truth. Right. And, oh, yeah. um, and that's what we're going to do today is we're going to talk about your own story uh, a little bit. So um, how did you come to be one of Jehovah's Witnesses in the first place? Was that something you were born into? I was born in third generation on both sides. Um, a great spiritual heritage that that you you would say. <laughs> but mm-hmm. but it's just something that runs in the family, like like, you know, a family business. Their children get into it afterwards, so forth and so forth. For us, it's Jehovah's Witnesses. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> it's uh it's like you you said this that Jehovah's Witness term, the rich spiritual heritage that they like to like to throw around. Um, so it goes. It's your third generation. Um, do you have a lot of family currently today who are Jehovah's Witnesses on uh, my mother's alive side? And around? Yeah, on my mother's side, pretty much all of them. Okay. Everyone over there. I've got, my mom was a sibling to nine, hmm. and most of them are still in. And then on my father's side, it's just practically just our little family, just about. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So your dad's side, then uh, most of the family would be termed worldly. They're not. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yep. All right. All right. Um, are, do you have any relationship with those people or kind of no. keep them at arm's length or? No, not, not at all. Um, like my, most. My mom's side, they're actually in Thailand, so I never get to see them. I can't even speak their language. But yeah. <laughs> um, for my father's side, it's it's just us, really. Okay. Like we we never really went to any family reunions. We don't really have a relationship with any of them. It's just our little circle. Gotcha. Um, it's a shame. I mean, I know the same thing happened with me, and it kind of keeps us isolated from people who you know could be allies and um, people that we could, you know, again, family, right? It's, it's, family is an important thing for most people and uh, a natural thing to want. It's a shame that we have to push those individuals away as Jehovah's Witnesses. Um, so you growing up with this deeply in Jehovah's Witness family, at least on one side, and, and the, sometimes that can create a lot of pressure what was the world view that it gave you growing up as one of Jehovah's Witnesses? It was very bleak, very dull. Um, it's almost like Jehovah's Witnesses give up on life before they even start. Mm-hmm. Like they always have the view that this world's going to end. Everything's only temporary. So why should we even put any effort in it? And as a child growing up in it, you're full of wonder. You're one of trying new experiences and having fun. But it's only temporary and all the people in there are wicked and they're going to die anyway. So why get connected to any of them? Yeah, absolutely. Um, 
I like what you said there about giving up on life. It, it is true. Uh, Jehovah's Witnesses see this life as a means to an end, right? Yeah, yeah. It's 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 weird. Like they don't see life for how it is. They see it as the afterlife, in yes. a sense of their own. Yes. Later, tomorrow, <laughs> whenever Armageddon comes, and it's always yeah. tomorrow. After that, then I can finally live. Yeah. Let's not use this world. Uh, I mean, I know they'll talk about not using this world to the full, but they just don't even, they're not really even engaged in the world yeah. around them so often. And it is really sad because, I mean, I think I can speak for a lot of us who are out. Uh, a lot of us missed a lot of opportunities and a lot of, I don't know, just uh, chances to engage with this world, to have experiences. Some of us lost our youth. Uh, there's a lot that has been lost to uh, oh, yeah. living a life of postponing life. It's like, like they encourage you to, you know, give your youth to Jehovah. And if you live your life to the fullest now, they won't get that reward in Armageddon because they've already received their gift. And technically that's what some person said, but it was weird. <laughs> right. Right. Um, it's like you're receiving your reward in full. If you participate in the world today, um, if you can just, hold off on that and not experience life today and let it kind of pass you by as you try to save people into this afterlife or this, this next life, this post-apocalyptic life. Oh yeah. Um, then you, you can actually live, you know, where they say the real life. Yeah. Yeah. The real life. Um, best life ever. Hashtag. Yeah. <laughs> yes, absolutely. But isn't it sad because they're, this is the real life. Yeah. Um, this is the only life that anyone can conclusively prove that we have. And yeah. you're foregoing real life for a phrase, the real life. Yeah. That it's, it's remarkable what they've done. Like just using the truth. Every single time they refer to their own religion, it's indoctrinating them over and over and over again. We are in the truth. We are living the truth. If I didn't find the truth, I don't know what I'd be in. But it's crazy because once you like look at everything and cross-examine it and actually do some critical thinking, you'll find out that this is totally opposite. <laughs> Whatever they're telling us, they're they're scrutinizing the Bible, they're scrutinizing themselves on the ARC. And it's just it's crazy because I feel like I've done so much research and so much effort to find out what I truly, really believe in. And they say, make the truth your own. And I'm doing that, but it's not lining up. The cogs aren't lining up. I'm, my square hole is not fitting into the circle. Well, right, because um, there's a difference between uh, making the truth, you know, the, making the truth your own can be, hey, take our doctrine that we've called the truth and assimilate it into yourself and just follow. Yeah. Or it can be, uh, making the truth your own can be being one of Jehovah's Witnesses and being that person that rides the edge and creates a life for yourself that is kind of a little bit of the best of both worlds as much as you can to try mm -hmm. to make it comfortable to be in the truth. Or you can actually go look for what's true. Um, and that may unfortunately set you free of the people in the truth uh, who will then shun you oh, yeah. because you are searching for what's actually true and not just what has been called true. Yeah, it, it's exactly what it is. And it, it's sad. It really is because these people genuinely believe mm -hmm. that is true, that it's, it is the right thing because it's all that they've ever been told. Mm -hmm. Like if like if you go on the internet, you'll see you know things of what's true, what's not. You know people saying different stories, and it's your own self that has to go and look and dig and find the actual truth to the matter. But they don't do that. They only look at one story. They only look at one website. They they don't look at everything else that is going on associated with the organization mm -hmm. and the pain that it causes. Like yeah. you can't deny how much hurt that this causes people. No, and you know, they're also starting from a false assumption that there's always a knowable truth mm -hmm. and that there aren't, you know, two sides to every story or 
uh, that we, you know, we can't know everything. Yeah. Uh, there, that, but Jehovah's Witnesses can't be comfortable in not knowing. They need answers to everything, even if that answer is wrong. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And that's just you know, to be able to be comfortable with not knowing. There's lots of things, you know, science doesn't know a lot of things. And there's um, so and that it's OK. We don't have. Why do we have to know ev uh, everything? Do we have to? No. We don't, we, no, no, you don't have to know every single thing to have a, a real true life. I mean, scientists, I mean, it's it's not 2020 vision of the universe. They only know the basic laws of physics and mm -hmm. somehow that laws, them laws of physics put man on the moon somehow. Mm -hmm. And honestly, I trust people who put a guy on the moon <laughs> with science <laughs> than, than someone saying that the, that it never rained in Noah's day, that there was a yeah. there was this weird bubble of water that the morning dew <laughs> would <laughs> and there weren't no clouds in the sky. But mm -hmm. but I'm like. We can dig up dinosaur bones. And we can date them back to how long mm -hmm. we can find evidence of fossils that correlates to it, it's what it is. It's evidence of ev evolution. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if anyone's Christian still on here and good for your faith. But I, personally, I, I I'm agnostic atheist. I don't believe everything until it's proven true. I'm from Missouri. It's a show me state. Show me that this is right. <laughs> but yeah. but they, they don't acknowledge evidence. Mm -hmm. Well, and evidence means different things to different mm -hmm. people, uh, right? And so uh, you're going to have people that um, find evidence in different ways. Uh, mm -hmm. Again, there are people even in science, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Are eggs good for you? I don't know. This, <laughs> these people say yes. These people say no. Uh, it's, know, it's conscience it, matter, really. Right. It is. It's, <laughs> it's a conscience, conscience matter. matter. <laughs> But, you know, it's, scientists are human, too. And so we get human biases that come into, you know, play in anything yeah. as well. So there is no, you know, ab, what is abject truth? Uh, sometimes we can know and sometimes it's not necessarily knowable at present. And um, it sounds like you've been on your own search for it. But let's mm -hmm. let's go back a little bit and look at, I guess, where you came from. So. Mm -hmm. What was life like for you as a kid let's let's start at home uh oh, what yeah. was your home life like what are what's your family life what was the temperature of the room were you all a family that went out and had fun or were you like really rigid in the in the truth or what was the case we were very very rigid um my mom was actually the head of our spirituality not our dad mm -hmm. so she came from a family of uh special pioneers um always devoted always pushing the truth on me ever since, you know, out of the womb, practically. And it, it's sad, really, because I, I truly believe that I was born to keep a dying marriage alive. Mm. And whenever, whenever it comes back to that, it's, it's like my dad and my mom don't really, you know, love each other, but they can't, you know, separate because of the scriptural divorce thing. But they made it work. And as a child, it's just hard taking in all of this indoctrination and having a warped view. But I'm trying to get my thoughts together. So that's okay. So let's just think about let's just think about um let's just talk about your family then. So um it sounds like you grew up. I mean, I like what you said. Well, I don't like that it happened, but born to keep a dying marriage alive. Um, I mean, let's face it. There are people. I remember there was a young couple when I was a kid, or when I was a, in my early twenties, I guess, who um, they had gotten together, and their marriage was really suffering. Uh, a lot of a lot of mm -hmm. them do in Jehovah's Witnesses. They're kind of set up to fail, and so they were. I just remember the wife saying, "You know, I think we're going to have a kid. We, will, I, I want to have a kid to save the marriage." Yeah, um, which not a good idea um but particularly particularly for that kid it's a lot of pressure on that child and the child's not going to save that marriage that relationship was between two adults um yeah but um 
you know, obviously that, that can be a lot of pressure on a kid. So, you know, for yourself, uh, is that something that you realized later or earlier when you were, I realized it way earlier. Okay. My, um, my father's somewhat of alcoholic and my mom doesn't really, <laughs> and me too. I don't really agree with it, but I remember he'd always, he'd always tell me, um, don't tell your mother because you're the glue that holds this family together. Mm. You're, you're keeping us together. And if it wasn't, if it wasn't for you, she'd already be back in Thailand by now and left me. And I remember as a kid, like, really pleading with my mom as she's packing her bags on the phone with a travel agent because sometimes I really believe that she was going to leave and this is whenever whenever I'm like six seven young and scared out of my flipping mind because all I know are my family these are these are the only people that I have I don't have friends I don't have I don't go to school and meet people and I'm allowed to you know have a normal childhood these are the only people that i know my mom and my dad the two most closest people to me and one's packing their bags and the other one's in his shed drinking beer but it, it, it's like they were always separated like and they put on this facade like whenever you go to the kingdom hall they're they're you know they love each other to deathly they're you know you know got her arm around her in the kingdom hall but whenever you go home it's night and day um i'm so sorry that that's that's uh actually abusive uh to you know to tell your child something like that and to put put that on them that's not uh mentally or emotionally healthy for that kid now all children uh you know when we're all kids we need to look at our parents for our their our safety our security they're the people that we're going to learn how to do life from they're supposed to be our secure attachment but uh, there's no real security and attachment for any of us growing up Jehovah's Witnesses uh, because it's all conditional and it's, there's always drama around. Um, but it is confusing and uh, you shouldn't ever as a kid have been made to feel like you were the person that was there to keep it all together. Uh, they're adults. They need to make their own decisions, uh, not based on the kid. Mm -hmm. And uh, you would never be responsible for how that goes in actuality, uh, no matter how much they try to pin that on you. That's very yeah. unfair. Mm -hmm. um, but it sounds like you had kind of this really this this dichotomy of this home life that. I think we would all agree doesn't sound great. Um, I mean, maybe you can tell me, uh, did, did you all. Were there good moments? I mean, I think there well, usually are at least some, but I mean, did you all do anything together? Yeah, have yeah, any good moments? <laughs> um, my mom, uh, she's, she's Thai. She, she came over here, immigrated from Thailand. Mm -hmm. um, so she's very, um, she's a big part of the Thai speaking community mm. uh, here in the, in the States. She has Bible studies on the phone practically every single day. And many have progressed to baptism. So we usually travel to those special conventions, assemblies, Ohio, Texas, California. I, we went to California practically every single year. We traveled, we hopped in the RV, booked it, went to another convention assembly, and it kind of got boring um, listening not to not only the same convention over and over and over again, but also in a different language where you don't understand a lick of it. <laughs> but Oh my gosh, that, that is nightmarish. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but but lucky I, I got to go to Disneyland a ton of times, go to different, um, I've been to practically every single state, but I, we love seeing that, the national parks and this and that, and it, it always bring up, Jehovah created this, this vast Grand Canyon for us to enjoy, and I'm like, but, but that guy just fell off a month ago. <laughs> <laughs> why do you make this big old hole in the ground for us to trip in <laughs> but um but yeah we 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 did a lot as as witnesses and i got to see many many um higher ups say in uh in the governing body i got to meet mark sanderson um and honestly he's he seems just like a regular ass joe he yeah. seems just like a regular person and you go up to him, talk to him, shake your hand. And this was when I was 14. Um, 
And then, and then now that I realize it, I'm like, I literally shook hands with a monster that kills people. <laughs> and, and I, I was baptized in Thailand when I was 15. We actually traveled to the special convention in Thailand and I got baptized with 250 other people. Oh, wow. Yeah. And, um, Stephen Lent was there. Um, the guy who did that homophobic talk on the convention, just uh, he was there. <laughs> okay. I don't know if you keep up with the convention, but uh, was, no, I can't. I don't, I don't know which one that was, but I mean, let's face it. Any of them yeah. could have given the homophobic yeah. talk. So <laughs> but, <laughs> I don't know uh, if the name matters. <laughs> yeah. But uh, I, um, <clears throat> but it's just always going to different conventions, different, different um different languages because my, my mom speaks a lot of southeast asian asian languages so we we just always traveled and she had parts yeah so, so that's part of the confusion too isn't it that sometimes you are going around and seeing national parks and doing some fun things yeah <laughs> along the way of a process that unfortunately um is far less fun and uh much more mentally and emotionally damaging yeah um, you know that that again it is part of the confusion it keeps us off balance and if we're off balance we're easier to control uh, mm. that's part of it too but at the end of the day jehovah's witnesses are still just humans yeah uh, and they 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 all are capable of some monstrous things mm -hmm. uh, but i also want to clarify this that belief system that there are many good people I am associated with people that I truly love and I view them as family. I just saw them last night. Mm -hmm. They're amazing people. And I, I don't think that it's, it's bad. Like it is bad what they believe, but what they believe, some of it is good. And they apply that. It's just what the higher ups do, what the organization as a whole do, but the rank and file Jehovah's witnesses, they're just regular people like you and I who've been led astray, but they, tr some of them truly are good people. Well, that's a. I guess that's where the, the 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 issue with labeling people as good or bad, as though it's a binary thing and that kind of a spectrum, is yeah. is, is kind of difficult because, uh, I mean, yeah, they are good people I know. in certain ways. And, like they're and they're I guess nice that's people. biased towards me because I'm still Pimo and I still associate with these people. Sure. But I know that. Hey, maybe this gets out and they find out and they shun me, but I don't care. Then I'll find out who they really are. But well, and that's but that's 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 the thing, right? So even good people are capable of some bad things at times. We're all human yeah. beings. And it truly and is sad. These are people is. who have good qualities, but unfortunately, they have something that they're involved in. Like good people typically, or we wouldn't typically call people who would shun their own children yeah good people right oh, or yeah. people who would let someone die in a hospital after giving during birth because they need a blood transfusion and we are pressuring them not to have it we wouldn't yeah. normally call someone like that a good person yeah but or someone who would wish for the eight billion people around us to be murdered so that they could live <laughs> forever in a panda paradise but mm -hmm. Everybody that, that that's the complexity of what it is to be human, isn't it? Yeah, you know, yeah. we we are capable of good and bad and everything in between. And yeah, and if the right or wrong thing is put in front of us and we buy into it, you know, I'm sure there were lots of people that did horrible, horrible things in Nazi Germany that previously had been seen as good people, right? Yeah, but we can get we can get lulled into things psychologically and we can be taken down a path it can make us do some pretty monstrous things i know yeah. I my own so. mom one of her biggest worries she told my wife is that uh that myself and my brother who are shunned will think she's a monster i don't think she's a monster but i think she does some monstrous things yeah i guess it's just i'm optimistic to my friends and yeah it's, it's sad really and I'm just, and it brings me back to Jesus. Jesus said, forgive them for they do not know what they do. And it's just, and yeah. I know that they don't, they don't know, know. What, what they're doing. They don't know. They don't know how much pain and death this causes. It's different causing pain, but people die because of this. Sure. 
Look, Kalani. Uh, <laughs> look up, look above me. <laughs> no, I <laughs> on know. On the video, it says Sean. Look at my shirt. It says Sean. I know. Um, and I know this won't be video, but um, I shunned my brother. I feel so guilty for all the people that I have too. Right, but I really feel guilty. But I, I didn't know any better, and so that yeah. that that's again the complexity of all of this, right? Oh yeah. Um, I did what I was told I had to do. I I did what I was told was loving. I struggled with it. Yeah. Uh, it never felt right or sat well with me, but I did it because that's what literally everything in the environment around me, everyone was doing. So I thought that was the way to be. And so, you know, when you know better, you do better. And unfortunately, a lot of people inside are just completely blinded. They're not evil people. They're Mm -hmm. all, you know, that's, they're not evil. They're not great. They're just people. We're all just people. Mm -hmm. Uh, Everybody's just a human being trying to figure this out somewhere on the spectrum between unhealthy and healthy, Yeah, trying to hopefully grow. But when you think you have the truth, growth is done, right? Yeah. It just feels like right now, like I'm a deserter in the military. My friends are going to be the ones on the firing squad, but I don't know who has the blank or not. Sure. Of (laughs) course. Um, I think you wrote in your email that you were to me that you were waiting on death row. Um, It it is truly how I feel because it's an inevitability. Like I, it's like, I know that I'm going to be dead to my friends and family. I know it. Mm -hmm. It's, it's like, I'm sitting here. In this one by one block that mm-hmm. I've made for myself, where I know that my I, I know my identity, and nobody else knows it. It's just me, mm-hmm. and I'm scared. And of the course. only and the only thing that I can do is after you know after the judgment is called, <laughs> and they say, you know, Kalani's no wonder one of Jehovah's Witnesses. And I got to look around at the people who I called friends and family. And I got to say, hey, now's your time to show your true colors. Do you really love me for who I am or the title that was given to me, you know, whenever I was 14 and ignorant? Sure. And sadly, Kalani, we know how this plays out. And and I see it multiple times because I know that they're under the same chains that I am. I know that they they're tied to their friends and family, too. And if they talk to me they're going to be shunned too. Mm-hmm. And and I'm just weighing out, hey, am I a valuable friend to these people? Or are these people a valuable friend to me? There you go. I just got to come to the grips. There I just got to come to grips with that. Are these people a valuable friend to me? So one of the harsh realizations that we often have to face when we leave is that the people we thought were our friends or family um again their relationships with us have always been conditional <clears throat> you may mm-hmm. find you know the outlier the exceptions to the rule one individual here or there that may continue being some sort of like a secret friend on the down low but that's or want to be uh, you know whether you accept that or not it's up to you but uh the reality is that I talked about secure attachment earlier. There is no real Mm -hmm. attachment because their identity is one of Jehovah's witnesses and that's what they're attached to. So if you detach from that identity, uh, they can no longer see you, feel you. They are going to shun you and they're going to think it's loving because they have been tricked. Yeah. And we often have to, you know, again, I feel like I'm on a coaching call instead of a. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm so sorry. Do you need me to venue you, Venmo you 50 bucks or something? <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah. man. Like, but this, seriously, this is the stuff we talk about a lot of times because a lot of times we we're looking back at people that we always wanted to be there for us. And because of that, sometimes we tend to idealize them. A lot of people Mm -hmm. leave and tend to say, Oh, well, my family won't shun me. Yeah, they will probably. Yeah. I I mean, I'm not trying to be mean, but that's, 
it, that's just it's, a reality. And truth. I think it's loving to tell you that reality. It is. Um, because you're not setting yourself up for more heartache and desperation yeah. than you're already going to have. So this whole thing of leaving is a grieving process. You're grieving the loss of an identity as one of Jehovah's Witnesses, as a son, as a friend. You're grieving the loss of a lot of identities. And then when you go back and look at them, you realize that a lot of those identities were really pretty shallow. There wasn't a lot of depth. And that's just because you can't ever even know yourself as one of Jehovah's Witnesses. You're not allowed to try to figure out who you are. You're told who you are. So there's always a shallow depth there. There's no real, there's, there's, there's nothing deep. And um, except for the pain, when you realize yeah. that everything that you once held so dear wasn't what you thought. Yeah. And that pain does go deep and it, it is a trauma for uh, most people. And, it, and it's, it's, it's tough. And, and I've, mm-hmm. I feel for you, you're 19 and you've got like this whole, life ahead of you which is a beautiful thing but you're also 19 and uh this is a lot to face at 19 it's a lot to face at any age but 19 especially yeah it's it's a harsh reality Mm -hmm. and it really is because this is not how biologically we are not supposed to you know i like my my pup my dog just had puppies she tore up my carpet because she locked herself inside of a room to get to her puppies. Mm-hmm. She punched a hole right through my flipping door. <laughs> so I got to go get a new install a new door now. Mm-hmm. But she uh, but she tried so hard to get to her kids, mm-hmm. like not even humans, just animals, mm-hmm. the things that they do to protect their children. And 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 you can't even call what shunning is animalistic because it's not it's not natural. In any way, it Mm -hmm. sucks. Yeah, it does. It's, um, it is the harsh realization. Jehovah's Witnesses love that scripture about how in the last days there would be uh, no natural affection. This is the least natural, it's the least natural thing that you could do. Yeah, it is. It's, and, and it is. It's part of gaslighting, and I'm not going to go too deep into this, but Mm -hmm. uh, to to gaslight someone is to, um, you know, the person who has the authority creates the reality. Yeah. Uh, And um, that the goal of gaslighting is to get you to doubt yourself again, as I mentioned earlier, so that you have to look to others to feel okay. Mm -hmm. And they will tell you what to think and what to feel to be okay. But the sad reality is that part of gaslighting is the uh, weaponizing of things that are near and dear to you uh, to control you. And yeah. what is more near and dear to someone than their normal human family relationships? Mm-hmm. And so extorting you psychologically, mentally, emotionally, yeah. there can be physical effects of this I... as well, extorting you through the family is a mm-hmm. really, really awful thing to do to another. I, I love the analogy that Harrison Cother gave um, from The Truth Hurts. Mm-hmm. He said he's got tape over his mouth and a gun to his head. But it's more than that. It's not tape over your mouth and a gun to your head. It's a gun to every single one of the people you love truly dear. Mm-hmm. Because they're going to be dead to you. Mm-hmm. And, and, it's, and it sucks. Because, it does, because because you know you know that there is a very slim chance that they are going to come back and talk to you. This is all that they've ever known. Mm-hmm. They need to take that first step into coming into the truth. <laughs> you, you can say, right. <laughs> yes. But you're watching your friends die in front of you for a cause that you know is wrong. Absolutely, and yeah. this is where you know, in the healing process, what we have to learn to do is a thing we were never taught to do, the thing that we were discouraged from doing. And that mm-hmm. is we have to learn to love ourselves. Yeah. Uh, we have to learn to be a, <clears throat> a self-contained unit, so to speak. Mm-hmm. Uh, doesn't mean that we don't value or want relationships or anything like that, but we can no longer get our identity through others. We have to learn to find it within ourselves 
and then to find other people that appreciate us for who we are. But this is where we have to just, we have to figure out who we are, find people who will attach to us and love us for who we are. Mm-hmm. And, you know, family is what you make it. And this isn't to, to um, <clears throat> lessen or take away the pain that it, that is about to come from the inevitable shining. It is something that, that hurts, uh, rightfully so. Yeah. And But, I mean, I can tell you my wife last night uh, went out for her birthday with a bunch of friends. They wore uh, – they all wore uh, like fancy dresses and went to the local Waffle House, which is not a fancy place. My and, wife loves Waffle House, <laughs> uh, and like they, they had fun and they 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 formed a catwalk in the in the Waffle House and they 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 played music on their phones and danced. And they got the employees in on it, and they they created a really really beautiful moment that was just free. And fun, and that incorporated you know, the people who were behind the counter working at the Waffle House, yeah. who got in on the fun. That is a beautiful moment. I love we that. We can have those moments because whenever you see stuff like that, you're not encouraged. You can't just walk up to a random person, shake his hand, say, "How are you doing? Are you having a great day today, friend?" Yeah. Instead, you have to be, "Hey, you're gonna die." Come with me and I will lead you. To, I will lead you to safety. Come with me if you want to live. But but you can have those beautiful moments with people in the world. No one is out there to kill you. No one's out there to it's not it, no one's going to die at Armageddon. They're not, and they're not bad people. You can believe whatever you want to believe. But all in all, down to our bones everyone has the chance to do good you just mm-hmm. have to let it happen don't hold yourself back because there are good people out there and even i know that i'm one of jehovah's witnesses it's all i've ever freaking known but i can see and have fun with other people sure you remember that scripture that they talk about a lot of times um <laughs> some people may hate me for using it in this way but whatever um there's a scripture that was used about how like you've lost mothers and brothers and fathers and sisters mm-hmm. and uh, you know, who has not l- left them or lost them for, for my sake, who will not gain mothers and brothers and fathers and sisters, you know, in abundance later. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not using it. I'm sure in the way that most people would use mm-hmm. that scripture, but um, there is a reality Kalani that we can leave we we're not leaving them they are going what what you're going to see i want to be careful in the way i say this is that your mothers and fathers and brothers and sisters and such are going to leave you uh, because you have come into your own because shining is an act that you do to other people right but you are about to walk into a broader world of people um, where, you know, again, I, I have far more friends today than I ever had as one of Jehovah's Witnesses. It's not easy. It doesn't happen automatically. We were taught many maladaptive coping strategies that push people away, and we have to learn a lot to heal and to allow people in. Mm-hmm. But once we do those things, we can have a lot of really wonderful and beautiful moments with people. We can have friends and family uh, again. And, um, you know, I've been able to create that for myself, my wife as well. And I see people that I work with do it at times. And it is something you can have. It's not, it's not something that you will forever lose, but it's, it, it, there's no way around it. It mm-hmm. is going to hurt when the inevitable happens, no matter how much we know it's going to happen. You just have to do it and rip it off like a bandaid, I guess. Mm-hmm. I don't yeah that we all have to decide what that path looks like for ourselves for sure yeah (laughs) and um we'll talk some more about that so um you said that you were baptized at 14 do you remember what i think it was 14 right yeah Mm -hmm. do you remember what led up to that um we i was in a rat race to get baptized first practically get baptized first and the youngest i had so many young boys in the congregation 
we were all practically the same age, but it, it was so clicky and I was the weird one, but gotcha. It, but it was like, who's going to be, who's going to, who's, who has more prestige, who has more praise, even at the young age of 14. Mm-hmm. So one person gets baptized. You're like, it's a bowling pin. Everyone has to get baptized now because, because they're leading the charge of, of, you know, the spiritual army. Mm-hmm. And so I'm like, all right, well, I got to get baptized. So I went through the questions and this and that. And I said a shitty prayer, one that I didn't even mean. And I'm like, and they were like, hey, why don't you get baptized at the special convention in Thailand where there's going to be like, you know, 20,000 people and 250 people getting baptized there, me being one of them. And it was all to pretty much just make my mom happy make my mom proud of me and make the only people around me like praise ultimately to look better. But I remember like standing there with this army in the middle of 250 people, all of them standing up shouting, yes, yes. I want to give myself over to Jehovah. And I'm just walking down this endless sea of people right down the middle aisle and everyone's clapping at you everyone's cheering at you and it's like you feel so good in the moment but now looking back i'm just like oh my gosh that was the stupidest thing i could have done and it was terrible but i remember (laughs) this was this is a kicker i was 14 and um they since we had so many people getting baptized, there were like 250 people. They separated the guys and the girls. We didn't get baptized in the restroom. We didn't change in restrooms in our in our baptism attire. We changed in ballrooms, <laughs> and we had like little dividers and uh, little lifetime tables that we set our stuff down. But I'm like 14, and dudes out here stripping, changing into his attire, and I'm like. I can see your dick, dude. <laughs> and I and I have not it's mastered. It's weird. Isn't it? I have Come not on. mastered the uh, the towel shimmy sure <laughs> so i get baptized and the only thing that i can remember for the entire rest of the day was how chafed my balls were after wearing wet wet underwear for the rest of the day <laughs> because i didn't, didn't want to take my box i didn't i didn't want to take my boxers off in front in of the- <laughs> so many dudes it was like a hundred dudes all around me <laughs> and, uh, isn't and i'm it- like yeah, and I'm like, well, I could see where the CSA cases come from. <laughs> no, honestly, Kalani, isn't that weird? Like, nobody tells you that. I'm glad you mentioned that. I remember when I walked in, too, uh, everybody was just standing around in the middle of this big room, just like all these naked dudes. And I was no like, no privacy at all. What the hell is this? And it was a uh, shock. And, uh, like, I, I, I didn't. I planned to like you know close my little door, get all changed, and then go change yeah. afterward. But I'm no, it's a flipping ballroom. <laughs> yeah, man. I, I found a there was a shower uh, in the back, and I found this shower that nobody was using. I went back there and changed. Everybody else was just you know buck naked out in the in the room, and I was like, this is weird. And nobody prepares you for this. Nobody tells you this is going to happen. It's just strange, and especially with all the language in Jehovah's Witnesses, just and all the shame around bodies and all the things to just suddenly as a teenager be thrown into a room with a bunch of naked adults. Weird. Because because everyone's like covering yourself up, like during the talk. I'm like, are you gonna wear white a white t-shirt or a black t-shirt? Because a white t-shirt will see your nipples in the sun. Yes, they're so concerned that your nips are going to pop out of your shirt. I'm like, this dude's dealing is hanging out two feet from me. And I'm 14 and this guy's 30. (laughs) Yes, it is very, very strange. It is just, it's just a lot to take in for a young kid who's never been thrown in a situation like this. And And where, again, the language is. And I was homeschooled. I never grew up with no locker room, you know, you know. Yeah. Yeah, so you don't get to see, you know, dude's dicks out. Of... <laughs> but yeah, I, I didn't grow up with that. I was freaking homeschooled for all of my life. <laughs> so, yeah, so, yeah, because I, I was going to ask you that. So being homeschooled, then um, it sounds like with you all, tra- it sounds like your mom's kind of like this. 
traveling JW rock star a little bit. Yeah. And so was your life then pretty much, you know, like, like leading up to baptism, here you are on this baptismal day, has mm-hmm. pretty much everything you've been exposed to just literally been your parents and going and traveling for Jehovah's Witness stuff for the most part? Uh, well, I, I was ho- I was homeschooled at uh, the fourth grade. So after that, that really picked up. Okay. So she she mostly just did uh, phone Bible studies. So only whenever like people got baptized, would we actually go to the convention or if they like offered her a special part, you know, in an interview position. So it, it really has because it is the cumulative part of your entire life. You are going to serve Jehovah. You're going to you're going to live forever and you're going to dedicate your life and it's all that it's going to be. And I remember like talking like, Oh, I'm going to get baptized. Really? Should I? And I, and like, even at that young age, you have doubts. You're like, it's, it's like, you're scared to mess up and get disfellowshipped. And they say that like, Oh no, you're going to be totally fine. If you love Jehovah with your whole heart, you won't have those doubts. Nothing will come up later on that you figure out that, I've been duped, but <laughs> well, yeah, baptism is a protection, right? That's what they would yeah. always say. It's it's being branded and you can't get it off. Like you belong to us now. Mm-hmm. And it's on and it's on you forever. And there ain't no way to get out of it. Like, yeah, that yeah, we don't uh baptize little infants, we don't baptize little babies, but I don't know. I've been around a lot of middle schoolers, I've been around a lot of preteens, they don't know nothing. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. They pat themselves on the back for not baptizing babies, but let's not act like 14 year olds who still play with, you know, probably maybe some toys or their life is, you know, is <clears throat> video games and fiction books or something. Yeah. They have no real life experience and no choice. That's not, yeah. that's not any better. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um. So you get baptized at 14. Does anything change for you? Does does the pressure ratchet up to the pressure ratchets up so fast? Okay. Um, because like it was always a competition between all the boys in the in the hall. Who's gonna be the first ministerial servant? Who's gonna who's gonna, you know, give their first talk? Who's gonna say their first prayer? And I remember going there and like patiently waiting. Oh my gosh, are they gonna are gonna say are they gonna announce it? Are they gonna say my name? Uh, Kalani, you are now uh, baptized as one of Jehovah's Witnesses. He got baptized and they never announced it for some reason. They were like, they waited like two weeks <laughs> and I'm just sitting here wait, wait, waiting patiently in my boot, shaking. Hey, uh, am I going to get called on? No. And I remember no one knew that I was baptized and I felt bad about it because I'm not getting this recognition and prestige that I sought after going to the other side of the world to get baptized in front of, you know, and tons of cameras and people but um it was just started a rat race of who's going to be the better witness so it was always uh doing your best trying to put in the most hours um and then um we had a new kobe a new uh coordinator of the body of elders and his son came and right uh, and this is about two years later all of the boys found the internet All of them left, every single one, until it was just me and him. And and then it's like, we're the last two standing. We're the last two here. And and, and, and we we didn't have no camaraderie, no sticking together, being like, hey, we made, we're, we're still here. We stuck true. It was more just like, I'm gonna be a better witness. I'm gonna have the most people love me. And then he's like, my dad's a Kobe. I can do, you know, I'm going to get all the prestige and praise. And my my parents are just rank and file Jehovah's Witnesses. And it was just always a rat race of who's what. And my dad would be like, why isn't why isn't Kalani giving prayers? Why isn't Kalani conducting the, the service meeting? Why isn't Kalani reading on on the stage? Uh, the Watchtower, not 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 Bible. <laughs> it's better if you do the Watchtower. <laughs> <laughs> And it was just a rat race going back and forth, back and forth with this kid. And I I learned to like, not really, it's weird because I I didn't like him, but I still had to see him every single, like two times a week, three times a week. 
And what's sad is the people in my old hall, like they, they were not good people. Absolutely not. Like, and, and I, I remember as a young kid being like, dad, why don't we just, you know, leave? Like, you don't like going out in service. You say that, oh, we're just, everyone gets their doors slammed. You never place anything. Everyone has the internet so they can Google us if they wanted to. And we're just going door knocking and getting our doors, our faces slammed in the doors. And he's just like, we're just doing what Jehovah commands us. That's all that we're doing. But I'm like, you don't like doing this every single weekend. We don't like doing this. We don't like going to the kingdom hall Sunday and seeing these people who can't give two craps about us. Mm -hmm. So why are we even doing this? Which led to us moving down to a different hall. Um, let's get to that hall in just a second. I think it's interesting that you brought up a couple of things. Um, one, that baptism is this big moment, really the only moment in a young witness's life where you get praise. Mm -hmm. uh, that's like your birthdays, your yeah. holidays all rolled yeah. into this. The only time mm -hmm. you matter. Yeah. Um, and, and that is a, there is kind of a high that can come from that a little bit, but it, it quickly comes crashing to back down to earth when you realize <laughs> that now you're just more dedicated into this thing yeah you've just gotten deeper in and now i think you bring up another interesting point and that is that young brothers <clears throat> are pressured to clout chase to yeah, and reach try out. to be somebody <laughs> to try to get some praise and acknowledgement it's mm -hmm. the only way they can is to do more in the congregation yeah <laughs> uh, nobody cares about them otherwise and so it kind of does create a really ugly atmosphere, doesn't it, between yeah, be uh, young brothers at times? Because it's your whole identity. People go out looking for for a husband. They're like, is this person a pioneer? Is yeah. this person a ministerial servant? Is he going to be an elder soon? Um, it's all based on uh, your spirituality. It's not based on who these people are as a person, if they are good or not. It's all on the, the pecking order. Yeah, let's not pretend that doesn't come into play, too, with the young sisters who might be looking for a mate, right? They're taught to look for a brother who is showing yeah. signs of reaching out or whatever, right? Yeah, so because I was freaking 14, and this is a couple of years later. I'm at the height of my teenage hormonal stage, and I'm just like, a, a girl's not going to like me if, I, if I'm not, you know, spiritually, like, way up there. I got to be the best of the best. I got to I gotta have that status. <laughs> and then now I'm like, it really doesn't matter. None of it does. <laughs> <laughs> no, not in the grand scheme of things. Um, you also mentioned uh, that a lot of your friends or the other young brothers, I think you said brothers, left Yeah. Uh, when they mm -hmm. discovered the Internet. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I have a question about that. <clears throat> How old were these young brothers who left when they left? And I mean, like, were they still at home or had they like graduated high school and then decided to quit going? They were 15, 16. I mean, like I, I give them props and, and I they feel, just, they and just, I feel and they so their guilty. Parents they didn't yeah, want to go. They just, they just told their parents that we don't want to go to the, the, the kingdom hall anymore. And I give them props because I remember you know, shunning them. And, I, and now I feel so guilty because I'm like, these people could have, could be going through the same thing that I am and they have no one. And I contributed to, to them having no one i could have been there for them and they all left and I, it was just like one after the other after the other and everyone started panicking like what what is going on these this is our new generation these people were supposed to go to bethel they were supposed to conduct our our watchtowers these were supposed to give our public talks but now they're they're dying like flies hmm. yeah any of them ever try to talk to you um and share with you what they had found no, because the only time that I'd see him is at the Kingdom Hall. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Since it was very clicky, all of them were related pretty much like distant cousins and this and that in small town. But um, but even then, I wasn't close to them then, uh, when, even whenever they were in the Kingdom Hall. So why would they talk to me? But Okay. Did you have yeah. many friends? Did you do I was fun? completely alone. Okay. Whenever I got pulled out of uh, school in the fourth grade, I went five years without any contact with pretty much anyone my age. I um, I, I had online friends. I I play games with them, 
And that's pretty much all that I did because I really needed social interaction. Like my parents would go off to work and they'd leave me to a young teenager to be so disciplined to go and do his (laughs) schoolwork. (laughs) I I spent a year freaking just gaming with my friends. And I remember when my mom, yeah. And I remember when my mom found out, she's like, you tell these people that you cannot talk to them. These are worldly people. You don't know if there's a pedophile on the edge end of that. And I'm like, he sounds 12. He's a squeaker, (laughs) but, (laughs) but, um, but she's, but I remember like her being over my shoulder being like, Hey, um, I'm one of Jehovah's Witnesses. I can't really talk to you right now. Um, it's for my own personal reasons. I'm sorry. And then I wouldn't, and I, and then that's like, these are the only friends I got. I don't even know these people's faces. I don't know their names, but, but they're my friends. So that's the only like human interaction that I had. Um, and, and I still have some of those friends to this day. We're tight, huh. but, um, I'm glad that they stuck around. Did you, did you get any education at all? all absolutely your- not. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. My parents did not contribute to any of my education at all. I cheated my way all through high school and I am not proud of it. <laughs> well, it's quite neglectful to leave your kid to do that. Uh, and <clears throat> not participate and check yeah. in. And like check looking back, looking back, I'm like, that is the most stupidest parenting dish. I could like you could ever make he's freaking a kid how are you going to expect him to do school whenever you know he freaking hates school how are you going to do it and looking back I'm like, I'm so stupid I should have stuck with it I should have done it maybe I could I could be in college by now but I'm not and and I and it sucks because like hindsight is always 2020 and I wish I could have done better but I just ended up cheating my entire way through school and I'm not proud of it. Well, sure. Nothing to be ashamed of either necessarily because you were just a kid uh, trying to figure this out with no parental direction. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's parental neglect. And that's sad in its own way. I'm sorry that you were deprived of that at an age where <clears throat> you should have been getting it in a, in, a, in a proper way. I mean, not that there's anything necessarily wrong with homeschool itself i just know that with jehovah's witnesses usually <laughs> homeschool is just a reason to keep your kids away from worldly kids and it, it really is it really is that's all that it was nothing more than that there's no real schooling going on a lot yeah. of times but i remember i got a community center membership and i went and i saw these kids that i haven't seen since the fourth grade and and we're freaking you know 16 16 15 now and I walk up to them and I remember them. Like, these are, the, these are the closest people I had in school. Like, I remember them like yesterday. And I walk up to them and say, hey, it's me. And they're like, who are you? They completely forgot about me. And I'm like, they completely forgot about me. Like, some people remember me, but like, some of the closest people that I've been to, they, they just totally forgot about me because I was pulled out of homeschool. And I'm like, I, I knew these people, but they, don't, they didn't even knew I existed. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Um, well, I mean, you've changed a lot in all those years too. Yeah. Um, and you all were little then, but man, that's, mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, that, that's a tough moment too. So I guess back to the kingdom hall. Now mm-hmm. you had a kingdom hall, I guess, where you were at least known on some level, even if it wasn't the greatest. And yeah. now you all are going to, it sounds like you all decide to just up and move to another place. Yeah. We up and moved so I could be with my girlfriend. <laughs> Ah. I um I I ride dirt bikes. I love dirt bikes and I met and I met my wife through through dirt bikes because she's practically the only witness who would take that such dangerous action, such dangerous risk and neglect the gift that Jehovah has given you by hurling yourself on two wheels. <laughs> yeah, I had I had a brother talk to me about that. You're you're neglecting Jehovah's spiritual gift of life by doing something so dangerous. But my but my girlfriend rode dirt bikes at the time. And I got so attached to her and it was long distance. And she and she moved down. So my parents were like, we already hate this hall. Let's just move down. <laughs> Let's just move down where they are. So that's what's so that that's what happened. And um, now now I live close to my girlfriend and um, we we know no one here, but we started going to this hall and it's okay, I guess. 
can't necessarily say good with the circumstances that I am that I'm in right now, but so um so how old were you all when you moved to this new kingdom hall? How old were you? I was 16. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So 16. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh riding dirt bikes. Are we talking like BMX pedal bikes or like motorized? Like, like motorized motocross, okay. you know. <laughs> That's I'm cool. A, yeah. Um and, and, and so, I, and I remember like going out uh, to races, um, late night Saturdays and Sundays, and I was getting good at it. Plus, plus, dirt bikes were the only thing that I ever did in my backyard. Since I had no, um, I, I was always competitive. I always wanted to, you know, play sports in school. But since I got taken out, I'm like, what's a sport that I can do on my own? What's a sport that on my own team? So like, other other than playing video games with my friends, I'd go out and spin lap after lap after lap in my backyard, and I got fast, and I wanted to start racing, and. Um, they're like, no, that's too dangerous. Plus, you'll be neglecting Jehovah. This, this, um, this can lead to you killing yourself. <laughs> and yeah, it's a dangerous sport, but still, you could do it safely. But it's just the fact that, like, you viewed people that went skydiving and bungee jumping, and like, yeah, like you're neglecting Jehovah's gift of life. And I'm like, that's so stupid. I want to live. I want to do fun stuff. Like, I don't want to go knocking on. I'd rather go hurl myself on a dirt bike track then go knocking on doors over and over and over again for hours on end with people saying no <laughs> yeah what is life right yeah i, I want to freaking live <laughs> yeah it's not living being one of jehovah's witnesses is not fully living and, yeah uh, you wanted to actively live so mm-hmm. allow me to break in here for a second this channel is made possible by you the listener If you appreciate what we're doing here, please consider supporting at patreon.com slash shunned or leave a review on iTunes or other platforms, uh, like and subscribe. All those things help the channel. If you're looking for merch, you can go get some shunned swag from the shunnedpodcast.com website or reach out there to be on the show. If you're looking for more ex Jehovah's Witness content, I'll recommend my first podcast called This JW Life. You can find that on podcast apps as well as YouTube. And if you're feeling stuck in life, struggling to find happiness in community, maybe you're haunted by the past, beating yourself up, unsure of who you are or what you even want out of life now that you've lost this one identity that was given to you by a cult, reach out through my other sites like xjwhelp.com, that's exjwhelp.com, or storyworkscoaching.com. And let's see about working together to help you find a life that fits you and who you are, maybe for the first time ever. And now back to our guest. Did you, as you got closer to 18, so you're 19 today, as you got closer to 18, Mm -hmm. um, uh, did you finish any kind of, so you finished school? Was there any pressure on you to like, you know, finish school and then pioneer or anything like that? At that time, I was, you know, falling out and I wasn't really into it at all. So they just kind of like, all right, so he's not going to pioneer. He's just going to be one of the rank and file Jehovah's Witnesses, pretty much. So when did you start waking up? When did you start noticing or or what started waking you up and when? I remember... um, like one time, like I knocked on the door and I was young and he just said, go to jwfx.com. And I went there once and I read through and like, eh, blah, blah, blah. These are just apostates. They don't really have anything to say. But what really woke me up down to the single video, it's a single video. Let me pull it up. I have it in my notes. Oh, geez, this is a good one. It's the untold story behind Russia banning Jehovah's Witnesses by Jason Zelda. Okay. That's a single video that woke me up because I like, oh, we're getting banned in Russia. What the heck could we have done? We're such good people. And I'm like, it's a government. They have to have a reason to ban us. They're not just going to ban us just because the Bible says so. They have to have an actual real reason. And I went through and I watched that video. I'm like, oh my God, it all makes sense. Yeah. It everything it they break up families, um, they promote hatred, and it, everything that it said on that article and everything that it said in that video 
just shattered everything like a building collapsing in on itself because everything made sense. And so once you had that shattered for yourself, uh, what were the feelings that brought up within you? Because you were still going to meetings and such, right? Yeah, I was still going to meetings. And um, this was in 2020. It was like at the start, mm -hmm. at the start of the um, pandemic. And I'm like, what am I going to do? I know all this stuff. I, and I've all, I, 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 before I didn't want to be a Jehovah's Witnesses for the sake of being a Jehovah's Witnesses because they do boring stuff. I don't like the way that they live. Now it's, I don't want to be a Jehovah's Witnesses because I don't want to be associated with the atrocities and horror that these people are associated with. It's two different reasons. It's one to be not be a Jehovah's Witnesses because you're just bored, but one, because this causes actual harm to people. And I remember like, my girlfriend ain't gonna marry me if if I come out I, and I love her like what am I going to do I'm like you know it takes that part of like you're uh, you're lucky that I, I'm lucky that you even noticed me like how am I gonna go find out another girlfriend I, I'm, a, I'm a loser so I'm like I want to and I really do love this girl I love her so flipping much that you know what I'm just gonna go ahead and marry her and see what happens just for because I love her because love is love. And I went ahead and did that. I proposed like six months before my 18th birthday. And then a month after I turned 18, got married and moved into our own place. And yeah, <laughs> now I have a kid. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so, so you and your girlfriend did get married. Um, and how long have you been married today? I've been married for um, a year and uh, eight months, I think. Year and eight months. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I don't know. I can't. I can't math it up right now. But uh, oh, that's September, okay. September's our second. So. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. So you've been married for almost two years, and most of yeah. that during a pandemic. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Okay. And um, and I love her from the bottom of my heart. I love her. And I'm so happy that like, I can talk with these things uh, about Jehovah's witnesses and she'll let me, I'm not pressuring it on her, but like, she'll let me show her things. Like I'll have, um, you know, Lloyd Evans in the background playing or something. Um, and then she won't be like, turn that off. But, but I'm glad that she's open to my beliefs and I'm not pressuring it on her at all. I'm letting her come in, but she understands the fallacies and how weird it is because I know you said, um, you don't, you, you haven't caught up on the conventions or anything. You don't listen to any of that, but yeah. this last one for anyone that like listens, uh, we just had our daughter and she's beautiful. She's a little angel and I, I wouldn't a little demon baby yes 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 a little enemy of god and it's and it's a running joke in in our little friend group <laughs> yeah little enemies of god <laughs> it's hilarious because like i remember sitting there and i i already seen the convention like i already listened to it at work and um and and you know poste reviews of it and all that but i'm like sitting there and i'm like wait waiting for the moment because i knew she's gonna flip out whenever she hears this shit <laughs> And it comes up and, and I can hear that wide eyed guy right now, just going, you might say it's a little angel, but in actuality, they're little enemies of God. And she flipped out. She's like, how could you say that? They're, they're innocent. How can you say that little babies are little enemies of God? And she flipped out and I'm like, oh my gosh, there's hope. <laughs> <laughs> well and let's remember that's Stephen Lett that's yeah. one of the the eight men who are led by Jehovah's Holy Spirit to dispense truth uh into this dark world yeah <laughs> from New York and and he's and I mean when you think about that whole little enemies of God thing I mean just the concept of original sin that there's something wrong with you as a baby from the moment you are born, you are in debt to God. You already are, are, are sinful and messed up in some way. I mean, 
Stephen Lett just said what they've always believed yeah. for a long time. He just said it in a very concise and terrible way that shines yeah. light on their terrible <laughs> belief. And it's so funny because I also showed her the, the apostate one and uh, that, uh, what's that freaking balding guy? <laughs> but he's like, um, what did he say? He said, freaking, um, go check it out. He said, don't look at any of that. But at the end, end of the talk, he's like, go check it out. Prove it for yourself. And I'm like, honey, he's saying the exact opposite thing that he said 20 minutes ago. And then she's like, yeah, he is. Like, there's no denying it. Sure. Like whenever you listen to the convention, you can hear like it's it's not it's it's not right. He's con contradicting himself in the same talk. <laughs> oh, they do it all the time. Yeah, yeah. Part of, that's and, part of gaslighting too. And then she read the first part of uh, Crisis of Conscience, and then she's like, "Everything you're saying is true." <laughs> so, yeah. well, that, I mean, you know, I'm glad that she can she can see some things, and yeah, um, and I solely believe, like, I think that um that she is in it for the social part of it because being one of jehovah's witnesses it's it's very social but in your small group and she doesn't want to break ties with any of that like she agrees that like what we do she doesn't agree uh she with you know blood transfusions and this and that and then she said i will never shun my daughter like i asked her will you shun your daughter and then she's like no i couldn't bring myself to do that and Oh, one big thing. I remember when my daughter, uh, my wife was giving birth to her and, and we had uh, some witness friends, our close witness friends, they were there too. Um, they came in just as the doctors were making the, uh, um, do, you, do you consent to like blood transfusions and stuff like that? And they were right there in the room. And we'd already talked about, um, you know, don't have your blood card in there. I don't want anything to happen to you. I want you to live on that table. I am not going to let you bleed out. And, and I remember right as she came through the door, her, her witness friend, she was like, so um, do you consent to a uh, blood trans? And immediately snap, like, no, no, no blood. No, do you have your card on her? And, like, and, and I remember her looking at me like, do you have it? And, and I'm like, I can't say no. I can, and she and they're just they're asking me, do you want her to have blood? And I just remember standing there, like giving her the look in the eyes. No, no, no. Like you can tell by your eyes. Just no, I do not want this. And I remember staring into her soul like, no, I do not want this nurse. Do not. And I remember she she left to go find a blank blood card for her to fill because her uh, husband's an elder. Right when that door closed, I'm like, please, please, please do not do don't listen to any of that. And and the nurse said it's it's her choice. So. And, and that broke me. It really did, because I'm like, this is not only your life, but it's the life of my daughter right now. And I don't want anything to happen. And I would gladly lay down my life for my wife and daughter. And and I just I, I want the best of, as a father. I want the best for my wife and kid and I and it's impossible because I know that being one of Jehovah's Witnesses is not the best life for my wife and kid nope and it and it's hard to come to grips that I need to drag them off this path that they are leading themselves on they are running in front of a bus and I got to go and grab them and I I want to make sure that my kid grows up the best that she possibly can and have the best life ever the real best life ever <laughs> sure <laughs> it's an unfortunate reality that <clears throat> there are people who are going to run out in front of that bus and we can't we can't always save them yeah because i'm like they're human this they're, is a way to time. help people blood transfusions are a way to help people <laughs> and then i find everywhere in the scriptures it says nothing about you know, putting it in your veins. And even Jesus, he, um, the, the Pharisees, they're like, why are you healing this person on the Sabbath? And he's like, screw the Sabbath. I'm letting this guy live the good life. And then with uh, Saul, whenever um, the, the awake article that said, oh, they were hungry, they were desperate. So he let them eat it with the blood. And I'm like, that's eating it. And he still didn't kill him. Right. So how are we supposed to 
expect that we're going to die at Armageddon when he didn't kill them. And this is the biggest one of all. I had such a big epiphany and such a moment of nirvana and enlightenment. Jesus, during the Last Supper, said, this is my blood. Take it on my behalf. And I'm like, the freaking son of God is telling you to symbolically drink his blood. What? <laughs> sure. You go to go to Acts and look at the scripture. Was it Acts 15, 28, 29? I think. Um, go look at the surrounding context. It's just an argument between two factions. And he's just trying to say, hey, you stop eating things sacrificed to idols. You stop eating you know blood you stop doing this you're just trying to get two different groups of people yeah. to get along this and is not I, some <laughs> biblical decree for all the eternity yeah and they had no blood transfusions back then anyway mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and and i i went into it with, with my wife like would you at like a wedding ring like if a guy mugged us would you rather give the wedding ring or have the guy shoot you like do you do you have i want a wife not a ring the ring symbolizes that I have a wife. Mm -hmm. So go ahead and give, give him the ring. And, and I know this from the bottom of my heart that they will not change at all. They have too much blood on their hands mm -hmm. to just go ahead and admit it Literally, to the whole yes. world that we've killed tens of thousands of people for no reason. Mm -hmm. And they tried to pull the, the, Oh, we can do uh, blood fractions now. And I'm like, all right. So say you don't steal a car, but you could steal their catalytic converter. You can steal the air out of the tires. You can steal their wheels. It's the same bloody thing, man. Yeah. I asked my, I asked my, my mom, I said, are sex fractions. Okay. <laughs> right. Like, and there's they, they no have reason all these, with them. all these rules about things. Uh, you know, the Bible doesn't say anything about blood fraction. Yeah. And I'll try to explain that it. Word and I'll try there. to explain it to people, and they're all like, "It's just volume. You can put water in your veins." And I'm like, "These people have a PhD in medicine, yes. and you have your <laughs> have five, eight old guys in in New York <laughs> telling you how to live your life, but not not only how to live your life, but how to die. They're telling you how to die." Yes, and I'm it's like, "What?" Yeah, it's a shame. Um, so today, though, it sounds like so your wife is starting to see some things and that that's good. Um, you've your daughter also um, is too young to see anything. Um, yeah. But, uh, you know, you, like you said, you want, of course, the, the best life ever for her, right? Oh, yeah, definitely. I'll do anything for her. Sure. So. Um, so today. You're in this position, and yet you're so you're Pimo, but yet you're here telling your story. Mm -hmm. Why? Why? I think... Why take this risk? Why put yourself out there? Why tell your story? Because it is a story that needs to be told. If more people realize that Pimos, you're not alone. There are tens of thousands, probably even a million people who are out there living a life that they don't want to live. And they know that it's wrong. But know that you have a community around. Know that there are people out there who have gone through exactly the same thing that you're going through right now. And yeah, I'm, I'm one of Jehovah's Witnesses. I'm Pimo. I hate it. I want to live the best life ever. For myself, I only get one shot at this life and I'm going to pull the trigger on it. Know that there is hope out there and there are people who will support you. And I'm doing this to not only for myself, just to get it off my chest, because frankly, this is the only time other than my wife that I can tell another person what I truly feel. Mm -hmm. what I truly believe and be true to myself and not live a double life because I'm putting on this facade, but inside I'm totally different and not totally different as a person. I'm just, I'm totally different in your beliefs, but that's all. Mm -hmm. I'm still the same person that you've known that you've seen going to the kingdom hall. But when I leave, it's just, I'm not in your location. I'm not going to be at the kingdom hall. That's, that's it. 
And I'm doing this because I, I want my wife to look back and really su- see the true self. If anyone that I know finds this, they'll, they'll know who I truly am, what I truly believe. And if my judicial finds this, um, well, you know the truth. So let's just get it over with. Um, it's, it's a hard life to live. I don't agree with a lot of it, but you do you, but know that you've got blood on your hands. Anthony Morris might say that you do from not knocking on doors, but you guys have blood on your hands. People have died on hospital beds. They've died um, committing suicide. Mm -hmm. And I've been there. I've done it. I've tried it. It sucks. It's the worst feeling ever. Whenever before I met my wife and I was bleak, my parents having a giant argument. I surrounded myself by the only things I love most, which was dirt bikes at the time. I went into that shed and I started them all up and I just went to sleep listening to Metallica. My dad came home and said, why are you in here? Came up with a lame excuse, but I'm glad he did because I wouldn't be here right now. And And now that I've been at the lowest part of my life, I know that I'm probably going to go low again, but I know that the only way is up. Well, I'm sorry that you got pushed into that position. It's, it's, um, it's a lot of bleak days at times as one of Jehovah's witnesses. I'm glad that your father found you. Now you have a chance to be a good father to your daughter. Mm -hmm. Um, Got a husband to your wife. Uh, and you know, it all starts with being a good Kalani for Kalani. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and, and again, loving yourself. I, um, I think that's, you know, it's, it's just such a shame that, you know, here you are, you can't be yourself with all of these quote unquote, good people. Mm-hmm. I think that shows something. Yeah. Uh, they're not so good if you can't be yourself. Yeah. Uh, find some people in life who you can be yourself with, who will accept you and love you for who you are. And uh, maybe even, you know, again, what is the greater love? Uh, loving only the people who believe, think, act uh, exactly like you or uh, having your arms outstretched in a big bear hug to love even people who disagree with you, uh, who may even fight against something you believe in. The, the ability to love someone even through a disagreement or through you know, huge ideological uh, differences. Yeah. Love doesn't That's judge. love. Love it's that scripture that it says love never fails yeah love goes through all those things and i'm like mm-hmm. you're not it's not the what, what your definition of love is is not loving no you, you say that shunning to, that disfellowshipping is a loving arrangement when deep down inside your heart whenever you first heard that you said what the heck that is the most opposite thing of love that you've ever heard because they're like, it'll bring them back to Jehovah. And if you bring them back to Jehovah, that is the best thing that you could do for them. But honestly, what they're, you're not, you're bringing just a body. You're bringing just some pile of meat to go sit in a chair at the kingdom hall because they do not believe it. If they have, you don't, a lot of people don't get disfellowship now just for sinning. It's for their own indoctrination. They don't agree with the doctrine. They just don't agree with what they teach. Mm-hmm. And the fact that you can be disfellowshipped from that shows that you, you don't care if people believe what they're telling you. They just care that you're in that seat in the kingdom hall and that you do what they tell you to do. Control is not love. Mm-hmm. Uh, just blindly controlling every aspect of another person's life is not love. Mm-hmm. And um, you have a daughter 
And I'm sure you and your mom, your, your mom, you and your wife are excited to get to know your daughter as she, mm-hmm. as she grows, you will be excited to see who she is and mm-hmm. to appreciate her for that. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not about just having a little mini me that you can uh, coerce into being another version of you. It's yeah. about who is this person? You have a, you have created a life and you get to see who this life is and help her to be the best version of whoever she is mm-hmm. instead of trying to make her whoever you want yeah. her to be. And I, I see this little bundle of potential mm-hmm. of a whole life ahead of her. And people say that, oh, our way is the cramped and narrow way. Our, this one is the widest. Think about all the freaking hardships and trouble and mental distress that I am going through right now. And you say that this is the easy way. This is the wide and spacious road. This is the hardest thing that I've ever done in my entire life. Mm -hmm. And you say that I'm going on the wide and spacious. You're just following the crowd. You're just following everything. But I'm searching for what is true. I want to teach my daughter the truth about life, how to live her life the best way. And if I know dearly, I'm going to be such a hypocrite knocking on people's doors, telling people how to live their life when I myself know that this is wrong. And how can I teach that to my daughter? It's impossible. She's the closest thing that I have to me right now. And I would shudder to lie to her for her entire life, all for the sake of just having these two, these few friends that I have. And it sucks. It really does suck. And I wish that it couldn't be this way because you're more likely to be born into a multi-million dollar wealthy family and live the high life for the rest of your life than you are to become one of Jehovah's Witnesses. And I'm like, how unlucky am I that I was born into Jehovah's Witnesses now? Why couldn't I have been born to this family? They live a totally normal life. They don't kill people. They don't rape people. Like my mom says, you're going to be a criminal and blah, blah, blah. No, there are good people out there. We're not all crazy or mentally diseased apostates yeah we're good i'd pe- say that lying to people and taking their money <laughs> and taking their childhood and taking their sexuality and at times taking their life over blood transfusions is far more criminal than just going and living your average life trying mm-hmm. to have some fun in it uh and loving people well around you yeah and you can do that without being one of Jehovah's witness and what one of the most scariest things that they told me was we're eventually going to have the judgment we're going to go knock on people and tell them that yeah. it's too late and i'm like we're going to get shot doing that like how are we supposed to knock on people's doors telling them that you're going to die pretty soon and i come to think of myself that like Okay, so we are preaching that 8 billion people are going to be killed in a mass genocide. You know, only 8 8 million Jews were killed by Hitler. God is worse than that. He's going to kill 8 billion people. And and he comes to the chance that, oh, it's going to be a great life for all of us. And, And it all comes back to Adam and Eve, and we've all sinned. And I'm like, why couldn't whenever I draw something and I mess up, I crumple the, the paper and I throw it in the bin. I start over. Why couldn't Jehovah have done that? Why couldn't he just flicked, you know, Adam and Eve off earth and start with two mm-hmm. new perfect people? Why did he have to go through all this rigmarole and, you know, have tons of imperfect people born when he could have just started off at, you know, the, the first where it all came from the parents. Mm-hmm. And even then I was so confused Because of that, because I'm like, why couldn't Jehovah just Thanos snap them out of here and start new? And it doesn't make any sense. And I I can't understand why we go around telling regular people that you, you have to join us or you're going to die. That's just the plain old fact of it. And people say, don't shun your children because that'll blackmail them into coming back. So they don't die. Everything comes back to so they don't die. So Whenever 
Yeah. <laughs> you see, Kalani, the, the whole thing, you know, being one of Jehovah's Witnesses is really just trying to save your own ass. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's being in fear of your God and that he's going to get angry and kill you. So therefore, do what he tells you to do, because might makes right and uh follow whatever it is he tells you to do because he has the capability of taking your life Um, Mm -hmm. at the end of the day that that creates a lot of internal pressure on people uh it's another reason that you know yes there's plenty of information out here for anybody who wants to find it at this point but information is not enough alone because being one of Jehovah's Witnesses is not merely an intellectual pursuit. It's very emotional. and People are caught up in a lot of psychological ways. And you can lead that horse to water, but you can't make it drink. You can show them all the things. But if they're not ready to see it today, you know, just like an alcoholic, as someone who's addicted to drugs, it's not like they don't know there's a better way out there, right? Yeah. But they're just, they're hooked on something. And right now... Uh, there's a lot of people that unfortunately, when you leave, are going to stay behind as you continue outgrowing them and going on your journey. They're not going to be able to come with you because they're stuck. And it's a shame. And I'm sorry that that is likely to be the course of action. But I'm very happy for yourself. Look, in the, at the end of the day, all you can do is save yourself. Yeah, you can't save anybody else. Uh, You can't go knocking on all Jehovah's Witnesses doors and wake them up. We just Mm -hmm. like you can't go knocking on everybody's doors and bring them into Jehovah's Witnesses. Um, You know, people have their own minds and hearts about things and we have to allow them to have that. There's nothing wrong with, of course, exposing Mm -hmm. them to things, but we can't control them. I know. Uh, And I hope at the end of the day. When your time comes for shunning and as you said and i think we can agree it probably is inevitable it is for most people uh there are some who can just walk away and okay you just weren't part of the right family yeah there's some reason i considered i considered fading away i really did Sure. But then it came to the realization that my daughter's going to be involved in this my daughter's going to be taught all of this and I can't just, you know, be, oh, he's just he's just a weak spiritually person and let my do- and I'll be viewed as a weak spiritually person. But my daughter will go ahead and get indoctrinated to this. And my biggest fear is getting shunned by my daughter. Mm-hmm. So I have to teach her the right way as a parent, what is right. And obviously. They're going to be like. He's leading his daughter astray. He's leading his daughter to die at Armageddon. Mm hmm. And I know that that's what they're going to do. I know it from the bottom of my heart. I know that I'm going to be shunned. I'm going to be dead to everyone that I know. So just like I said, like I'm waiting on death row or I have a terminal illness and I'm going to die. I I genuinely feel that like I'm coming into acceptance and my own mortality per se. Mm -hmm. Well, Sometimes something has to die in order to be reborn and (laughs) uh, in order for you to go on to this next part of your life, you may have to leave one behind. And let's face it. I mean, don't all abusers groom their victims to keep their mouth shut? Yeah. (laughs) Um, I mean, I'm not trying to, I not casting aspersions on anyone who chooses to fade. Everyone has to, make their decision as to how they want to exit. I'm just happy you get out. I don't care how you get out. Mm -hmm. Um, I just want, you know, I don't think there's one right way to do anything really, but um, they want us to keep Mm -hmm. quiet. Because there's no right way to to leave the witnesses. There's no right way. Right. Because it's not, it's not the right. It, it, it it can't happen that way because it, Everyone is watching each other. Is this person a good witness? Is this person Mm -hmm. a bad association? Bad associations spoil useful habits. And that can be even within us. We have double agents within us. We have to watch around for spies. And it's true. Sure. Yes. There are a ton of double agents in in the witnesses. Mm -hmm. And also, I'm just like, same as me. I'm looking around. 
who might, you know, actually be PIMO too. Someone that I know might be PIMO and how can I help them? But you never know. No. You never know until they take that first step out, which is why I'm doing it today. Good. Well, Kalani, I appreciate you taking this first step. I hope, I know it's not easy to do. Again, courage isn't the absence of fear, but feeling the fear and doing it anyway. And we talked a little bit about that before this conversation. Um, I know it's not easy to do, but I hope that in the end, um, you know, sometimes there, the only way around is through and you have to go through a thing in order to get beyond it. And mm-hmm. um, I appreciate you being willing to come on and speak your truth. It doesn't have to be the witness's truth and that's okay. And they can have their own. Mm-hmm. Uh, just don't be dicks about it and shun people. Yep. <laughs> I live my life by a book of four words. Now don't be a dick. As <laughs> long as you're, as long as you're nice to everyone, people will be nice to sure. you, but don't be a dick to people. <laughs> I mean, treat others the way you would like to be treated. Yeah. Isn't that kind it, it of? It all comes back to that. Right. right. Well, I appreciate you telling your story. And uh, I know it's going to help other people out there who are PMO. And I know how difficult, difficult it is to speak out. So I hope you feel proud of yourself. Thank you very much. And everyone listening, this person, Michael, is such a wonderful person. <laughs> he has touched every single one of the PMOs out here. I know that. I listen to him all the time. And I want to, from the bottom of my heart, thank you for all that you have done within this community. I appreciate it, Kalani. It's my pleasure. Uh, I I just want to help too. And as, if we're all putting ourselves out there to help, uh, certainly some good things will happen, right? Thank you very much. As always, I want to thank today's guests for being vulnerable and sharing what they went through as they remember it. It takes a lot of courage to speak up, and I hope that it helps others to know that you aren't alone as well. You can find us on Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube at Shun Podcast. You can also join our Facebook support group called Shun Podcast. The theme song for the podcast is Save Myself by Jane and the Boy. And as I end all of my episodes, love yourself and others, do no harm, and go be happy. I could crumble into pieces, but I got a million reasons why I won't. Cause this heavy is a season And the sun is always right behind the storm